We've spent a lot of time talking about the Holy Spirit. She went back and looked when he started chapter 8. But I know it's been a while. How do we relate to the Holy Spirit? This is what chapter 8 was all about. My relationship with Jesus Christ is through the Holy Spirit. It is through the Holy Spirit that I can know what the Word of God is saying as I read it. For me to receive the Holy Spirit, I must believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. I must repent of my sins and go and sin no more. When I repent and believe, this is then when I am filled with the Holy Spirit. I don't speak in tongues. Depending on what crowd I get into, I can talk Dutch. And people won't understand it. I guess they could say I was speaking in tongues. I guess then I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, depending on where I'm at. <coughs> Day is the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came down on the disciples and they started speaking all kinds of languages so that the people in the communities could hear what they were saying, could understand the words that God was telling them to speak. I'm not going to say that the Holy Spirit, being filled with the Holy Spirit, will lead us into speaking in tongues. I'm not going to say that being filled, filled with the Holy Spirit, if you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, I got it backwards. Let me start over. Being filled with the Holy Spirit, you're going to speak in tongues. If you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, you're not going to speak in tongues. If you don't speak in tongues, you don't have the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to say that. To strike those words. Take them off the record. And neither am I going to say that the Holy Spirit, being filled with the Holy Spirit will not lead you to speaking in tongues. That it will never happen again. Because I don't know what God has in store. If He wants someone to speak in tongues, by George, they're going to speak in tongues. Because that's what God wants. The Holy Spirit is the conduit that connects me to Jesus Christ. In chapter 8, verses 12 through 14, tells us that we are under obligation to live not to the flesh, but by the leading to the, of the Spirit of God. For all who are led by the Spirit are the sons of God. Meaning that we have Jesus Christ, we are filled with the Holy Spirit, then we are the sons of God. And at the end of chapter 8, we are told that there is nothing in this world that can separate us from the love of God. Verses 38 and 39, For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor heavenly rulers, nor things that are present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore I exalt you, you brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a sacrifice, alive, holy, and pleasing to God, which is your reasonable service. Do not be conformed to this present world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may test and prove what is the will of God, what is good and what pleasing and perfect. Did I lose you? You didn't find that in chapter 8, did you? Did it flow right through <clears throat> from 8 to 12? It does. Chapter 12 continues on about talking how we should live according to the Holy Spirit. When we have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, then it is important that we live accordingly. Having the Spirit of God living in us, 
Our bodies become a living, breathing house of God. And it is important that we present ourselves as alive, holy, and pleasing to God. We are not to be like this world, but to allow the Word of God to change our way of thinking. By the way, those two verses that I read were chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. We are not to be like the world, but to allow the Word of God to change our way of thinking, allowing us to be led by the Spirit of God so that we can be called the children of God. Chapter 12 goes on to say that we are not to think. Just because I have been given the status of sonship into the family of God, that I am something more special than the person over there. The reason is that God has given each of us a measure of faith. Each of us a measure of faith. Meaning that Gary isn't better than I am. I'm not better than Gary. He's a Sunday school teacher. I'm the preacher. That's our label. Doesn't make us any better than Jan. We each got a measure of faith. So we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually we are members who belong to one another. We belong to each other. We are to lift up each other, to hold each other accountable, to love one another, give each other a shoulder to cry on, celebrate and praise the Lord together. When there's something wonderful going on, we join in. We're happy about it. If something bad is going on, we join in. Support and pray for them. <clears throat> Give them a shoulder to cry on. So you see, we could go from chapter 8 and go right into chapter 12 and not miss a beat. Not miss a step in our walk with Jesus Christ. Because it does flow from living with or our relationship with the Holy Spirit into how we need to allow the Spirit of God to change our day-to-day -day thinking. This then brings the question of why are chapters 9, 10, and 11 here? Chapter 8 ends with proclaiming that nothing can separate you from the love of God. Then in chapter 9, verses 3 and 4, For I could wish that I myself were accursed, cut off from Christ for the sake of my people, my fellow countrymen, who are Israelites. To them belong the adoption as sons, the glory, the covenant, the giving of the law, the temple worship, and the promises. Basically, the Israelites are the chosen people. As I've been studying this and thinking about this and looking at it, I can imagine that the person that was dictating for Paul said, wait a minute. When he finished up his chapter 8, he says, wait a minute. What about us Israelites? Aren't we the chosen ones of God? Don't we have the promise? That we are God's special people? What about us? You're talking about the Gentiles. Did God break His promise with us? 
Did God break His promise to His chosen people by offering salvation to the Gentiles? Since the gospel proclaims that it is for all who believe in Jesus. Did God break His promise to the Israelites? If we are the chosen people, as the scriptures say, why are there, so, there are some who God has condemned and not others? All Israelites are descendants of Abraham. The covenant that God made was with Abraham and to his descendants. Therefore, if we cannot be separated from the love of God, why are there some who God has condemned? Chapters 9, 10, and 11 are about the Israelites. They are about the chosen, the elect people. It is about the past, the present, and the future of Israel and how it relates to the promise that God made to Abraham. These three chapters, we can really get down in the weeds. We can go down rabbit holes, that really are not, will not lead us to anything. Here's the thing about the chosen people of God. Not all of them, all, not all of the descendants of Abraham are the ones, as, as it says, to, are the counted. The promise was made to Abraham but only to the son born of Sarah, Isaac. Yes, Abraham did have another son by another mother. And yes, God did bless him. He became a great nation. But these people are not counted in the ones that are chosen to be God's special people. But God said to Abraham, Genesis 21, But God said to Abraham, Do not be upset about the boy or your slave wife. Do all that Sarah is telling you, because through Isaac your descendants will be counted. But I will make the son of the slave wife a great nation, for he is your descendant too. And then we have here in Romans 9, verse 10 saying about Rebekah having twins. And God says, the older will serve the younger, and Jacob I love, and Esau I hated. God told Rebekah that the younger one, the one born last, would be the one his promise of election would be on before they were even born. It says they didn't have a chance to do anything good or bad. God picked the one, but didn't pick the other one. Pharaoh is told that these people are God's firstborn son. Exodus 4.22 You must say to Pharaoh, this is what the Lord has said, Israel is my son, my firstborn. These were the elect of God. Which begs the question, do I have a choice? Must I choose to be among God's counted or not? Do I have a chance? Do I need to be a descendant of Isaac to be counted as a child of God? Do I have a choice or do I just simply live my life as good as possible and hope he chose me? that I'll be counted among the chosen. Is there injustice with God? The one he loved, the other he hated. How can a loving God hate something? How do 
I know if I am one of the chosen to be a child of God? Does he pick some and not pick others? How do I know that I don't have a chance to make it in the kingdom of God? If you go back and study Romans, in the beginning, in the previous chapters, it talks about our faith and obedience to the Word of God. Giving us the right to call ourselves a child of God. This is based on our faith and belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. In chapter 1, it tells us that we can see God's eternal power, divine nature through the creation that He has made. So that people are without an excuse. It doesn't say the chosen ones don't have an excuse. It says the people. Do I need an excuse if I'm one of the descendants of Isaac? If I'm one of the chosen? And then it goes on to say, although they know God, they did not glorify or give Him thanks. Then the last half of chapter 8, it talks about being predestined. Called, justified, and glorified. Who can bring a charge against God's elect? And then it says, that being in this group, nothing can separate us from the love of God. So if you're one of the chosen, God has picked you to go to the he heaven, then nothing's going to separate you from the love of God. No matter what you do. I can live my life how I want and God's still going to take me to heaven. Is that what this is saying? Have I just contradicted the scriptures? Or do the scriptures contradict themselves? We are told that when we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we will be saved. When we live in obedience to His Word, we have earned the right to be a child of God. Other, and Scripture also tells us that through this process, we are being made holy in this world. And once we are finally holy completely, we are in the presence of Jesus Christ. But then it says that God chooses or has elected those He wants to belong to Himself. Which is it? <clears throat> They're both taught in the Bible. Which one do we believe? I hope you're all thinking both of them. There's no lies in here. There's no falsehoods in this Bible. Did you stop to consider that? So is God unjust? No. Can we fully understand God's ways? Can we fully grasp the extent of his wisdom and knowledge. Romans 11, verse 33. Oh, the depth and riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how unfathomable his ways. That's the end of chapter 11.
God is a sovereign God. Do we know what sovereign means? Absolute authority. He is all power. He has all power. He is all power and authority. In simple terms, he can do what he wants. And it's not wrong. Being God, and all loving God, he is not unjust, nor unrighteous. We also know that he is a merciful God. The Bible teaches us that God elects or chooses some to be his own. It also teaches that man, man must respond to the call of salvation. It is both ways. We cannot ignore the one and believe the other. We cannot believe one just a little bit more than the other one. We must believe them equally. Can we in our human mind comprehend it? I can't. How can this be? They are both in the Bible. Therefore we must believe both of them. Whether we want to or not. We need to realize that the problem is in our thinking. It's not with God. It's not that God is sending mixed signals. It's just that our mind can't wrap around the power of God, the, His ways. We must remember that all of mankind, because of our sin nature, is condemned to eternal damnation. The scripture tells us that. We all deserve to go to hell. So in God's love, His wisdom, His mercy and grace, why wouldn't God reach down and pick a few for himself to call his own? I believe we all know people who are not Christians. But in our minds, we think they're a better person than I am. Why didn't God choose them to be his child? But he chose me. I look around at the world and wonder, why did God choose me? Why did he choose to call me? Why not? Because I'm a terrible sinner. I don't deserve it. He chose me. You have to tell yourself that. God chose me. You know you have Jesus Christ in here. You have the Holy Spirit living within you. Why did God choose me to call me? I don't know. The important thing is I responded to the call.
Isaac Watts wrote this. And when I saw it, I thought, that is pretty good. Why was I made to hear thy voice and enter while there's room? When thousands make a wretched choice and rather starve than come. We're going to get into chapters 9, 10, and 11. I don't know how much time we'll spend there. I don't know where it's going to lead. But it talks about, through 9, 10, and 11, it, it guides us through this of being elected, chosen, and the choice that we have to make. That the response that we have to make to be chosen. That God has called us. And then we heard His voice. How long we spend there? Depends on the Holy Spirit. I've had a lot of conversations with different people about being predestined. We don't have a choice. That we can't come to God or come to Jesus unless God tells us, which is very true. That's scriptural. We cannot come to Jesus unless God calls us. It's in John 7. I'm not sure. <laughs> but I think we have to keep in mind both things are taught in Scripture. We come to Jesus Christ responding to the call of God for our salvation. It is up to us to believe Jesus Christ and to respond. It is also true that God has chosen, elected. And I'm not going to profess that I'll give you the answer to how this can be. Because I'm not God. And as I thought about this, I'm glad I'm not. Because I'd hate to be the one to decide this one's going to hell and I'm not going to save this one. And I'm going to pick this one. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, We thank you so much for your word, for the scriptures that you have given us, the living word. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the Holy Spirit who dwells within us to guide and lead us as we read your living word. In those scriptures where we are confounded, where we say, how can this be? Help us, Heavenly Father, to understand that we must obey your word, no matter what. Whether we understand it or not, we must obey it to the best of our abilities. And that the Holy Spirit is dwelling within us to help us in understanding the word so that we can obey it. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for your grace, your mercy, your love beyond our comprehension. Believing in you, loving you, we are given the privilege call ourselves a child of God.
thank you for having sent your son Jesus. Pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.